Welcome, welcome, welcome to the working that is Chrononaut Chronicles. My name is Bill. I will be your host for this particular Sonic adventure, taking a quick look at the Farmer's Almanac for any potential energies in the next week that we can work with and capitalize on. Today is actually a new moon, so new moon Monday, uh, right on. Wednesday is moon and moon and Mercury is in conjunct. Uh, Thursday has Moon and Venus conjunct, and that is also the day that Venus goes stationary. And Friday is Moon and Mars and V Mars. Moon and Mars are conjunct. And uh, side note, not normally on the almanac, but this week, a solar storm forecast for Thursday is expected to give stargazers in 17 states a chance to glimpse the northern lights. So if you're in Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, that'd be me, New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, Indiana, Maine, and Maryland. You should, uh, you might have a chance to see some, some cool northern lights in the sky on Thursday. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, I've got two chrononauts with me uh, this, this episode. And uh, Derek Condit is back with us after couple episodes uh, absence and his store mystical wares is the sponsor of this show so derek what has been happening and uh, what are you grateful for i got kind of um, well i've been crazy busy as i'm sure a lot of you have as well um so it's just a, a whirlwind here especially running a, a we'll just call it a medium-sized retail store um with mystical wares that you just mentioned so that's that's been something in itself. Uh, a lot I'll just kind of skip past on that one, but it's unique times, I'll say, um, to run a store and have that many interactions of the the walk-in customers a day and what what comes. I guess I, can, um, I don't know how much that we want to get into right now. We'll do gratitudes first. But I was going to say, pretty pretty unique place to be working here. Um, even having those, I'll just say real quickly, those copper pyramids in the back the individuals that come in to, to um, make use of them, you meet a wide range of people. Um, so it's been, been interesting. Actually, I guess I'll jump into my gratitude. Um, I'm grateful for, and it seems like an easy out, but this place, Chrononaut Chronicles, um, Owen, Adam, Ben, you know, yourself, all of us together and all that we talk about, because it's, it's been an unbelievable, um, just situation after situation for years now for me, um, depending on which aspects I'm talking about. So it's been a lot of fun. Again, unbelievable. If I'd seen what happens in my life almost daily on a TV show, I'd say it was CGI or just, you know, made for TV stuff. So it's been a, it's been really interesting. So yeah, I'm grateful for, again, I guess I'd zoom it out to all of you for having this space for us to share some of this, these stories and things. Right on. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. And I have a quick question before we hear from two other Chrononauts. We just had Adam join us. We'll get to Ben and Adam here in a minute. But I know that Mystical Wares is a relatively new endeavor. It started in 2019. So I'm curious, is having a brick and mortar uh, site, is it how, like, how, are you selling more through online or is it, is it, uh, is it, you know, I know you do a lot more with the space than just the storefront there, but as far as sales are concerned, is it a lot of internet traffic or is it more walk-in? Um, that'll vary uh, depending on the time of year, but roughly 90% in store and maybe 95%. I mean, that huge of difference. Oh, okay. oh yeah. And then the smaller amount online, believe it or not, is, is how it really works out. And I had no idea getting into that, what, how it was going to work out. I just kind of, you know, jumped in both feet. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. And like I said, we've got two other chrononauts. So Ben and Adam, I guess we will kick it to whoever unmutes first, or I can call on somebody. <laughs> kick the beep. Yeah. What's going on, buddy? How much? How you doing, Bill? Long time no speak. Yeah, you've been you've been absent for a couple. I know, I know. I'm the podcast now. loser. That's all right. Yeah. It's okay. We're thank you, thank you for showing up. And uh, what? Uh, how, any updates? Like what's going on, buddy? And then. Uh, well, it seems to be that your work sigil may have done some good. Ooh, uh, I did so. get offered a job that seemed like essentially it was the job I was just doing before. Um, so I ended up turning it down for a multitude of reasons. 
Uh, but yeah, things are starting to spark and I've got a few other things I'm looking at. So I don't know, man, you certainly put some blood in the water. That is super cool to hear. Well, it's still activated, right? I still, it is still around. So it's, uh, it's not going to stop working, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for being here for this new moon Monday and Ben, Ben is with us as well. Ben doesn't have headphones, but he's uh he's uh being a trooper and using his iphone so ben how are you doing good um i'm grateful for uh having the opportunity to share this space with you guys again and it's actually giving me an opportunity to take a break from working in the hot sun today so found a spot in the shade and a cool drink and uh looking forward to sharing some time and space with you fellas. Awesome. I'm glad this is uh, opening up in an area for people to come and relax and it's actually serving, you know, serving a purpose. It's nice to see. And uh, I did mention Ben wasn't using any headphones, but Adam and I talked about this on 13 questions a whole lot was that you don't need speaking of gratitudes and like being able to be here, right? Like you don't need a whole lot of super techie equipment to, to do a podcast. Like if you have an iPhone that is, a huge like tool to use in order to you know record and, and produce podcasts so yeah speaking of being grateful for being here in the show um yeah my, my gratitude. yeah an iphone in your pocket is going to give you better quality editing across the board you will be able to do more than they did at the top of radio profession in the 20s and 30s you know, like the heyday of dramatized radio in your pocket, you can do more than them. You can record and rebroadcast like it, we are living in uh, a magical time. It is magical. This podcast is magical. It is called a working. I'm calling it a working after all. But uh, speaking of working, the uh, the point behind this gratitude segment, I should mention real quickly, is basically to perpetuate our heart brain coherence. So this is just a little exercise that uh, you can do on your own every day, basically, pretty much, to uh, to get those gratitude gears greased up, right? So uh, just thinking about anything that brings you joy and, uh, you know, really trying to kind of bask in, in the feeling for a moment, if you can, during the beginning of your day, right? And it can be anything, right, big or small. But uh, my my particular gratitude for this episode is going to be the, the Wim Hof breathing app the phone app it is i've been i've been using it for i don't know if i had my third session today you get five free sessions right and you gotta start paying but it's it's super cheap so i'll probably continue to do that but uh it's something i've been talking about on the show uh before and i've actually started to do it and how long were you able to hold your breath for oh today i can look real quick um my i think my average was two Two minutes and 39 seconds. Which, I don't know if it's good or bad, but for being a... Uh, smart... uh, I bet most people, if they were to do that right now, probably wouldn't make it past 40 seconds. Oh. well, Unless they whim off for, you know, five or ten minutes. And then, uh, yeah. yeah, you're... Don't do it while you're driving. But... No. <laughs> no, I did it laying down. Both both days. Well, both the third first day, I think I was sitting up, but uh, yeah. my now, let me ask you this when you did it the first time, because for people who don't know, it's it's highly oxygenating your system. Right. When I was uh, trained on it, you would like take a as deep a breath you could take, let a little bit out to let the pressure off, then take more in and a little bit out. And you would do this over and over and over. And it became uh, not only uh, very energy enriching where you could stop holding your breath, but um, very euphoric. Um, I was in a room of people and people were, uh, it was very good that they were laying down because you could literally see them getting hit with just like a, uh, a huge, you know, natural high. Oh yeah. It is definitely a way to get high on your own supply and Wim Hof will straight up tell you that. Um, but let's see here for, for me, I guess as session one, first session was an average retention of two minutes and 56 seconds and uh session two well okay yeah so about two and a half minutes which uh 
yeah for being a smoker i don't think it's very it's not too shabby but my first time yeah my first time was at actually cac it was in duck creek village in utah with brandon powell and the gramerica boys and i actually I had to talk to Derek about this after my... Uh... Well, then we have the exact same story, but at a different time. Oh, okay. Many people, same everything. Brandon did me as well. Did, did, were you, you, did you get to lay down? Did you have a comfy spot? No, no. I was kind of uh, parked right in front of a sofa, leaning up against the edge of it. Yeah, it's definitely... But it didn't matter. No, okay, good. Yeah. But I I find it easier to, to do everything laying down, including meditating. So. But oh, I... Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I would, but that's just because it's easier for me to take really deep, deep breaths in a sitting up or standing position. And they definitely do not recommend you stand, no, at least yeah. not not when you're first starting. Right. And maybe that, that'll change for me as I get stronger. But the way with the way that my back is right now, it, it can't really stay up in that position for too long, you know, comfortably. Right. But gotcha. uh, yeah, it was absolutely euphoric. It was it was like mystical. Like I've, I've, I uh, could feel like energy balls on the top, like the tips of my fingers. And then there was a one in the center of my palm or, or kind of like where the, the thumb muscle is. Right. And uh, it kind of freaked me out. Right. Cause we only did it. It was one morning that, that I partook in the breathing sessions. We had the option to do two, but I only did one and I forget how many rounds we did. I don't know, if, at least three, I would assume or imagine. But uh, yeah, it uh, was definitely had a lot of releasing going on. Like I felt it difficult to relax when I was taking in all the oxygen. I don't, don't have that issue anymore. Maybe I'm not doing it right, but I think I am. But uh, yeah, was that like uh, was that like was it was that the same thing for you, Adam? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had any experience with scuba diving. No. Um, have you ever been? scuba diving bill i have not okay well derek will, will um glom onto this i'm sure um the same feeling that like uh sometimes when you're coming up to the surface that lasts like i don't know 10 30 feet as you're coming up and then breaching um i it's the the high from that is incredibly similar similar so it's kind of just like a, a runner's high but you know uh you know to the nth degree stronger do you get any uh, ear action, like any ringing in the ears? Ooh, I don't remember. Because that's definitely something. I don't remember because I honestly I haven't done this in years, which is shame on me because it's just breathing. Like I could stop and do it right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the ringing in the ears, there's definitely seems like there's a program. Or I'm definitely uh, recognizing a pattern. Like it'll be a, a, pitch will come and then it'll it'll fade out and that'll be like the first 20 30 breaths and then you, that's and then after that is when for me like you get the bottle the body tingles start start showing up but back to like the, the you can feel like, like i said like you feel the energy on your hands like that's isn't this uh what we would call like what reiki per, you know, practitioners or whatever would call working with well, it, have you ever yeah. have you ever taken niacin, like a flushing niacin, a B a B vitamin that causes flushing? I'm going to say no. You should. Uh, it's a wild experience. Um, but if like somebody could trick you really bad if they gave you some of this, because when you take it, it causes that very similar sensation, and it's actually going out to your nerves. Like you can feel your feel the B12 in your nerves. You can feel the increased blood flow and you get a burning and a tingling sensation um, that spreads throughout your fire. And by burning, I mean, it can literally feel like your skin is on fire, um, but it it doesn't have like that fire feeling, but it's a very similar um, feeling, which is why I think it has to do with the, the highly oxygenating of the system. Um, that's really like, cause I mean, you're essentially just like supercharging, you know, your entire, your entire nervous system with an extra dose of oxygen. I mean, there's a reason that people go to oxygen bars. They don't have to do that. They can just breathe more frequently, breathe properly, you know, don't inhale hydrocarbons. Well, and it's, it's not just the extra oxygen and other gases that your system is processing. It's the, the motion of the breath work is actually doing 
other things internally and you're it is really a reset like you're saying not just for your nervous system but for a lot of other systems in your body and um they're starting to show with scans now that you're pumping your pineal gland with that breath work as well so you're supercharging your um dmt pump as well I mean, it makes sense. It's a system we don't use enough. I mean, it used to be you'd either be running for food, running for your life, or in Wim Hof method, jumping into water and reacting to the cold. That the environment and the things that you were forced to do would, you'd automatically be supercharging this. So it kind of makes sense that your body was just taking advantage of, um, you know, uh, environmental and physical effects that were and have always been there. But now, when we don't have it, like we need to find a way to supplement it like a vitamin. Yeah. It's well, a-, for a, lot the, a lot of the world has always been part of the culture and practice, right? The breath work, um, especially in yoga cultures. And that's where I find like you, you do certain, uh, certain patterns of breath and where you're, where and how you're taking it in where you're breathing into the body you're resetting those systems as well in your gut and things like that um not just you know oxygenating but getting things back into alignment and flowing properly you kind of broke up there but I got you. I got you talking about uh, being able to uh, target different uh, points of healing, basically. Yeah, breathing into parts of the body, and and resetting those systems as well. Yeah, it uh, it definitely it it gives you a lot more energy after you're done. Like you, know, you just feel happier. I think in my opinion but uh what what is interesting is in the retention part like when you're because you exhale all the way until you have no more air in your lungs right and then you hold that for as long as you can and and during that part i was in the third or fourth round yesterday and what during the app uh wim is talking to you like he's he's it's a guided meditation and he has a few uh interesting thoughts to share at the beginning and then if you hold your breath long enough like you'll stop talking and then it's just music right so but uh the other day i was using it in conjunction i was doing this in conjunction with my aqua cure which i don't think i've ever talked about before on the, this show or or 13 questions but the aqua cure is a it's a um brown's gas generator invented by george wiseman who's been a guest on crow triple seven which is where I found out about it. So I've had the machine going on. I've had the machine for going on about two years now. And uh, I haven't, I haven't done it in conjunction with the Wim Hof, but I think uh, during that retention period, I might have, I don't know, passed out or went somewhere where somewhere else real quick, because I remember, I remember the machine was, was off when I kind of jolted up out of my, my seat and uh, this was over the weekend because I remember looking over at where my workstation is set up for, for my day job and thinking I had to, you know, I was missing work for whatever reason, right? So I, I just did, didn't realize when I came to, like, where I was or what I was doing. And But then I remember that the machine, the, the AquaCure shut off, right? It's not too loud, but it was, like, right next to my, excuse me, it was right next to my head when I was doing the breathing, right? So... It was uh, certainly an interesting experience. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and that when you first started talking about it and do you know your experience at Duck Creek, um, because I was there as well, and yeah, having Brandon coaching you through it, and the uh, <clears throat> you know the drone and drumming, um, really kicked it up a notch too, but. Prior to that, I've been practicing a little bit of Wim Hof through the app, and because uh, he made it free in 2020, 
um, when everybody was locked up in their house. Um, so I had it then, and I had been practicing different nose breathing techniques as well. And I did it on top of a mountain um, in Colorado uh, before heading to Duck Creek and had a similar experience where I passed out and it was a out of body kind of trip. Um, pretty interesting, but kind of waking up and taking a minute to remember what reality I'm currently in. Yeah, it was wild. It was like waking up from a dream, but it only lasted like, you know, half a second. It seems like, because you, when you're using the app, you have to you have to follow the prompts for the breathing, and then when you want to do end your retention, you get, you double click on the screen, and then it'll have you do a recovery breath, and then you go on to your next your next sixty breaths or however much you you decide to set the app for. But uh, yeah, it just. Uh, it's a good refresher during the day. It really brings you into the moment, which is one of the things that Wim talks about on the, the guided meditation part is disconnecting from the, the thoughts and being in just the feeling of being, right, of consciousness. So, yeah, super, super grateful for that. And uh, Ben, speaking of breathing through the nose, does it, because uh, I tried to do this with Wim Hof, and because I know that mouth breathing isn't necessarily generally recommended, I don't breathe, believe, but when you watch him do the videos, it looks like he's taking in a lot of air through his mouth, right? So when I, but when I try to do the method with, you know, inhale with the nose and exhale with, with the mouth, my, my nose gets like super cold, like the, the air, the air going in and it's, it gets uncomfortable. Has that ever happened to you, Ben? Or do you like... What is your method? Yeah, um, it is different if you're not used to it. And I started the practice because I've broken my nose several times and it's kind of screwed up and um, affects my sleep, things like that. Um, but your sinuses process the gases differently than just taking it through your mouth and into your lungs. So I think there's something um, to that as well. And... Um, through some of those yogic breathing lessons I was, I was reading through, it's been a while, so I'm trying to, trying to recall all of this, but, um, you have a dominant nostril that you're breathing through and that switches throughout the day and it can, it can affect your kind of how you process your energy and, and, and utilize it. Um, so just, it's sort of a mindfulness exercise as well and being, cognizant of what side of your body is is um doing most of the work for your breath interesting it gets uh, it, it yeah it gets really deep and 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 you know there's so many different ancient techniques that you i don't know i kind of started getting lost and um my practice started slacking off so I'm looking to uh, change it up and get back into some of that work now too. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of just basically had to just start doing my own. And I think this is the point, like my own pace. And, uh, you know, instead of trying to do every inhale through the nose, it would get to a point where I would, I would just start inhaling through my mouth because it was more comfortable, but I would do the nose for as much as possible. So then that's the point, right? Is to be comfortable while you're, while you're doing this. And another uh, caveat, I guess, I'll mention what I found while using the app is that there's three like speed settings you can use for breathing, with slow, normal, and fast, right? And to me, they're all too fast. <laughs> but I am also uh, 6'4 and probably have very large lungs compared to the average person, so that might have something to do with it. Um, just con conjecture, though, I'm not really sure. Um I would think you're getting used to it as well, too. You know, you're using that system differently. It's it's utilizing different muscles and, and probably building up a new muscle set, you know. Um, and your body starts to get accustomed to it so that that reset becomes even easier. That's it. At least that's what I found it, through my experience with it. 
and now the you know a couple of conscious breaths in the day will be a full reset you know i don't have to sit down for a full session um the the body and like muscle memory of it all kind of gets ingrained so i think it'll get even better and easier as you go i have noticed that after doing the however many rounds of breathing you do in a session that you're comfortable with i i, I find myself taking bigger deeper breaths like periodically right after you know th- for the rest of the day and i don't you know i don't normally do that but it is like it's like filling almost i don't it's kind of hard to explain if you don't if you don't experience it yourself but uh just a note one more note on breathing and we'll move on i do remember in all of our interviews with the mark england referrals for 13 questions adam you you should remember this the uh one of the the things that mark said on his interview i think this was towards the end was that uh, gun to head, the the breathing is, is more important than the story work, right? So, and story work uh, in regards to rewriting, you know, your your own, your you know, writing your own gospel essentially, right? Like doing doing the reprogramming of past traumatic experiences is is you know good and necessary, but a lot of the healing work is is done through the breathing because it's physiological, right? So. Uh, breathing is a huge, huge addition to any practice, and uh, I'm happy to to have added it. But it is interesting. I wanted to do a little experiment, and Derek, you're going to have to help me out with this because you have uh, a unique way of perceiving things. And I would like to, next episode, since I just mentioned the aqua cure on this episode, um, I, w- I would like to maybe have you... Uh, do a general scan or, or uh, you know, perception of like a baseline reading of, of me, right? And then I'll use the AquaCure for 20 minutes. And then after that, we can do like another like check-in. And then I'm curious to see like how you would uh, describe what happens, right? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, we'll have to connect again off the air and do that and set it up. And yeah, I'd be I'd like a link to that too, so I can, you know, research yeah. more about it. It is eaglesearch.com. I'll get it here. Okay. A second. Awesome. Yeah. So I actually did try to get uh, George on thirteen questions because I know that he has an a pretty interesting life story, which he talks about on other shows. Uh, uh, he uh, he declined, but completely understandable. If you if you know about uh, his background and what he's gone through, and uh, truly a uh, salt of the earth human being, in my opinion, answers all the emails he gets sent to him. And uh, yeah, these these machines um, seem to be uh, a uh, a grain of, of of gold in a sea of granite analogy i just came up with speaking of uh precious metals though uh the second segment we've i've been kind of uh kind of batting around the the idea of uh, coming up with a new name for it because i don't really have one i've just been calling it new business which i think is is relatively boring so i've decided to rebrand the second segment we're going to start calling it the silver segment right and I will, there's a couple of reasons for this, right? Number one is because we started covering some current events on the show. And hopefully these, these aren't stories that every other podcast is, is covering, right? So these, these aren't going to be the, the headline stories, but I'm sure that those will eventually pop up every now and again, um, just because uh, we live in a crazy world, right? And it seems like things are getting weirder and weirder. So uh, the silver segment, when we when we talk about these stories, we're we're going to try to look for silver linings in any of these uh, news stories, and uh, I'll try. Today is pretty it's pretty light, and not really a lot of uh, traumatizing things. Maybe except the abduction thing that's kind of traumatizing. But excuse me, I had to take a drink of water. <clears throat> That sounded bad. 
And then uh, the second reason is uh, we are doing this on a Monday, right? And Monday is the moon day, right? And silver is often uh, correlated with the moon and is the second day of the week, Sunday being the first. So we've got uh, silver, we've got moon, and silver is, you know, the second most precious metal next to gold. So again, we've got the number two coming into play a little bit. So, uh, yeah, the uh, silver segment, looking for silver, silver linings and uh, doing a little bit of moon alchemy at the same time, I guess. And uh, that's really something I got to work on is cutting that out. But this is a open, still open segment. So if anybody wants to uh, bring anything in particular they want to address on the show, a uh, something new that you learned, um, because this is you know still about increasing our, our knowledge we're keeping abreast of current events, which is is it's important because it provides context for for our lives, right, for our story. And uh, but I am going to strive to start the segment every week with uh, something a little bit more educational and not hopefully not a uh, a news headline. So uh, this. This particular episode, I thought we'd start out with mole people. Who believes in mole people? Does anybody believe in a hollow earth or or concentric spherical earths or anything uh, in that camp? There are so many caves and caverns in underground cities. Of course it's possible there's mole people. Absolutely. I've actually never heard of the term before. Um, but I agree uh, with that logic from Adam. That's I just hadn't heard mole people, but the inner earth and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've got a uh, little interesting historical snippet here about uh, John Quincy Adams and the mole people. So uh, I'll put this article in the chat for you guys. And I should probably put that in the show. Derek, do you mind throwing that in the... The, the live chat. Sure. Please, thank you. Okay. So uh, this is from historydaily.org. No doubt U.S. presidents use their position of power to do some strange things, but John Quincy Adams just may win the award for the weirdest appropriation of tax dollars. Believe it or not, John Quincy Adams, our sixth president, authorized an expedition to the center of the earth to search for the mole people who he believed inhabited the bowels of the planet. Here's the story of the president and the mole people. President Adams loved science and nature. John Quincy Adams, the son of our second president, John Adams, was interested in science and nature and had a passion for exploration. During his lifetime, scientific exploration was reaching new heights. Lewis and Clark had commissioned to explore the western frontier and, around the world, adventurers were setting out for uncharted territories in search of the unknown. Adams believed the hollow earth theory. Although it has been suggested by many historians that John Quincy Adams had the highest IQ of any president, he had some deeply held beliefs that we would scoff at today. I'm not going to scoff at them, but one of them was his support for the hollow earth theory. During the 1810s and the 1820s, many academics and scientists thought that the earth was a hollow sphere. Actually, it was theorized that the Earth was made up of a series of concentric layers, each containing its own subterranean world. This world was illuminated by a sun-like heat and light source at the very center of the Earth. Adams wanted to meet the mole people. Life would thrive, 1820s scientists believed, in the worlds beneath the Earth's surface. There would probably be vast natural resources to be found there, as well as subterranean people. Darwin's theories on evolution were still decades away, but believers of the hollow earth theory, like Adams, assumed that some sort of human-like beings had adapted to the underground lifestyle that there were communities, and that there were communities of mole people. Adams was influenced by John Cleves Sims Jr. During this time, a self-educated scientist and ex-soldier named John Cleve Sims Jr. 
was making the rounds across the United States, speaking to crowds about his hollow earth theory. The purpose of his lectures wasn't just to educate his audience. He was trying to recruit 100 brave companions. Since Sims believed, as other hollow earth theorists did, that there were chasms in the ground at the North and South Poles that served as gateways to the center of the earth. He planned to launch an expedition in Siberia. Sims needed Adams and Adams needed Sims. Not everyone took Sims's theory seriously. In fact, some people laughed at him. It looked as though he wouldn't be able to raise the support he needed for his expedition to the center of the earth. This is this is a really interesting tidbit coming up, I thought. But he found a supporter in John Quincy Adams. Adams was a brainy introvert who was more academic than presidential. In the presidential campaign of 1824, Adams was viewed as indecisive and cautious, while his opponent, Andrew Jackson, was seen as bold, decisive, and authoritative. During the campaign, Adams promised to back Sims's expedition. Even though plenty of people scoffed at the idea, they saw the move as proof that Adams did have a backbone. They had a newfound respect for Adams that helped him win the election. Can you imagine that? If some, if some politician came out today and said, yeah, we're going to go look for the mole people, and everybody backed him, and he won. Like, that would be, that would be amazing. Uh, needless to say, oh, wait, no, we're not done here. We're not done yet. Sims wanted to establish trade with the mole people. So Adams was interested in the thrill of discovery and was curious to see what natural resources would be found beneath the earth. He was also hoping that the new discovery would be the legacy of his presidency. As for, as for Sims, he sought to establish trade and tra to, to establish trade with the mole people. No doubt he was hoping to gain profits for himself by establishing trade between the surface world and the subterranean one. And uh, yeah, needless to say, the expedition never happened. Uh, John Quincy Adams only served one term as president, and in that time, he was not able to pull together the support and resources needed to fund Sims' journey. When Jackson was elected president, he immediately nixed the project. Despite his failure, Adams' presidency did see some lasting scientific endeavors. He established the Naval Observatory in Washington, in Washington D.C., and more importantly, helped to make sure that the money from the estate of James Smithson went to the establishment of the Smithsonian Institution. So as far as we know, no other president has, has attempted to establish diplomatic ties with the mole people of Middle Earth. So the mole people put a man in office, we could say, historically. It's fact. Yeah, and they probably found them and uh, just stole all of their resources and... Uh buried them buried them so they would give them back to the mole people lock them in their hole anyway I don't know it's an absolutely fascinating story I've never heard that before neither have I and uh, kind of sad that nothing this expedition didn't happen because I know that Admiral Byrd went to mm -hmm. the South Pole and had some very interesting experiences down there. So, not not mole people, though, not, not unless they're flying around UFOs, which is possible. We had telegraphic snails as a topic the other week. Anything's possible. So, are there actually mole people under under the surface of the Earth? I'm going to say, Derek. Oh, I bet there's Maybe. lots of different types of mole people, of individuals living subterranean. Terrarian? Terrarian? Yeah, how the heck would you even say that? Subterranean. I think that it's super interesting. He wanted, he was serious about establishing trade with these, the, these people, right? And I know that there are stories of American Indians establishing trade with Bigfoot up in Derek's neck of the woods. So there is a type of xenolinguistic uh you know science underlying that that thought right ben do you have a comment on mole people okay 
I was just uh, taking in, you know, with the way, in much in the same way we look at um, Sasquatch being interdimensional, you know, where you find the portal is where you find it. So um, is there one to mole people realm? Sure. Um, a lot of people have, or a lot of cultures have had subterranean you know, spirit, um, folklore forever. So, um, you know, all that, um, comes from somewhere, you know, there's, there's truth in all the myth. So whether they're mall people or time knockers or, you know, gnomes, sure. And uh, we respect all uh, all societies living on this earth that uh, that we inhabit. And uh, I I dug something out of the back of my uh, my back of my memory hole. There is an episode apparently. I think it's just an episode of Flash Gordon, which is a serial uh, series of a sci- science fiction adventure very very old black and white you can see the strings hanging from the the spacecraft as they're being filmed you know as they're filming it's 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 freaking amazing and queen did a remake of so everybody knows flash gordon right but uh, there's an episode with mole people in it so there's another reference to uh subterranean life forms in pop culture and and in history it put uh put a president in office go mole people So this this next story isn't I didn't find it necessarily too uh well here we'll just get into it it's uh it's about the mysteries the mystery of Romania's living stones they grow reproduce and breathe has anybody heard about these stones called trovans before this is news to me but it reminded me of shaman stones or what it's another name moki marbles I think is another name for those yeah, I was going to say, I've read about these, and it was, I was reading about um, uh, shamanism and specifically, like, the European lineages of, of that, you know, Russian traditions and um, Germanic things, and the um, actually Native Americans have a similar idea, the Southern Utes, anyway, uh, do, um, where the ancestors will reside in the stones. Uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah, and I, I've heard of these living, breathing, moving rocks. It's fascinating. Yeah, it makes this... sense. I mean, that's really what crystals are. You know, they can continue to grow, like you know, just letting salt crystallize. It it moves when you put it, and you know, uh, speed it up. It seems to have like a, a natural motion to it. Like this is this seems very similar. It seems like it's a a giant crystalline structure. Well, the article says that they look like something from an alien plantation on another planet. But the living rocks of Romania, known as the Trovans, Trovans, are really are of this earth, and they're naturally formed by geological processes. Starting out as pebbles and growing at about two inches per millennium, the Trovans stones are unique mineral structures that mimic plant and mammal life. The bizarre bulbous stones almost appear to grow in the same way as plant tissue, and they give birth, quote-unquote, to new stones, just like an animal. The Travant stones are found in a small Romanian village called Costetsti, about 50 miles of west of the capital, Bucharest. They look like blown bubbles made of rock and very greatly in size. We just lost Ben. Uh, Oh, he's back. Some spanning several feet in diameter, others small enough to fit in the palm of the hand. The Trovants from Romania have very different ages, uh, says a some guy from the Geological Institute of Romania. Trovants do not simply appear above the ground. They are present in the mass of sands of different geological ages, which reach natural outcrops or in sand quarries. Trovants is a synonym for the German term, I'm going to try to say this, 
Sandstein concretionin, which means cemented sand. The word trovant was used in the first time in geological literature from Romania, said Dr. This doctor from Romania. Do, uh, visitors to Costetsi sites can walk by the large variety of spherical and spherical and ellipsoidal trovant stones. Each grow slowly over time in the presence of rainwater. They're mainly composed of a hard stone core surrounded by sand that forms the shell. Minerals and rainwater form a reaction within that builds pressure inside, which makes the rocks the rock grow and multiply. Much like the rings that make up the girth of, the, of trees, the trevants reveal layers when cut into, each representing a period of growth. Although not alive in the scientific sense, locals and tourists alike have described them as living because of the way they appear to change with time. So that uh, it's not the only location where Trovant stones are found. A, a study co-authored by uh, another doctor describes them all over the Carpathian area of Romania. However, the ones at Costetsi are well known and have large diameters. They are spherical and egg-shaped, but many of them have twinned, complicated forms. One of the features of the Costetsi Trovants is the presence of numerous micro trevants smaller spherical tubercles on the surface of the big ones besides the big trevants there are a lot of smaller imperfect ones but with a clear tendency to sphericity the study says all these trevants are placed in yellow fine medium or coarse sands containing also fine gravel and it's from the daily mail so yeah that's kind of like a the formation of a shaman stone. It's sandstone and something else, isn't it, on the inside? As I say, we have those shaman stones, as they're called. Um, they're called, you know, or satin crystals. They go by lots of different names um, here at Mystical Wares. And they're, they're unique energy. To, I'd never, um, I didn't know about them until... I think it was my daughter that gifted me a set of them. And sometimes they'll say one's a male version and one's a female version, you know, depending on who's explaining them, because some have a, a more pronounced ring around them or others don't. So they're at least in the rock and crystal world or these type of shops that I have, they're sold as like a, a yin and yang or male and female version. Um, and even as I'm saying that, both my ears are just tingling and uh, the tinnitus of them, you know, the ring in the ears is going crazy which is always, you know, more to the story type of thing to put loosely on these. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, I got a set in my office somewhere around here. Yeah, I recently purchased a set uh, this past, one of the past uh, gem rock mineral shows that we went to. But uh, they, I think they're found in pairs, I believe. Like they're, you dig them up or you find them when they're mined, right? You have the female and the male one like right next to each other. So they're they're already paired when they come out of oh. the earth, I think. Huh. I, I don't know anything about it. That's interesting. Yeah, that's my understanding of it too, Bill. And I, I have used them and it really does balance that that yin and yang energy um within you. But something I found interesting, those led me to uh a stone called shamanite, which I'd never heard of and kind of raised an eyebrow at when I saw it first, but it's a black calcite. And I've found the combination of those stones to be really helpful in the dream space. So sleep, do you sleep with one in your pillowcase or just use it for when you want to go journeying? Yeah, both kind of near the bed every night. And then um, I'll hold it if I, and just, you know, intentionally go into the journey space. It looks like Apache Tears, Ben. I'm sure you're familiar with those as well. Yeah, I, I carry those too. But this, uh, the chunk I have anyway is, um, it's definitely a calcite. You can, you can tell um, not only by its vibration, but just its physical appearance. But it is, you know mostly there's a little bit of flecking in it but it is just a deep black that kind of helps you navigate the void space i guess 
and maybe I should try to incorporate those uh the moki balls or the shaman stones however you want to call them in my next breathing session and see what happens which reminds me uh that one that that story i just shared about uh, passing out or whatever 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 happened right i was using i had a uh, mystical merlinite i had a piece of mystical merlinite or indigo gabbro is another term for it on on my chest as i was laying down and i know that that has a lot to do with the upper energy centers so maybe Maybe there's a connection there. I don't know. What do you think, Pat? I don't think it hurt anything. And yeah, you can say you've passed out, or you can just say your higher self paused your game for a minute. Yeah, it was definitely something that I will try to recreate. But it didn't happen today, because maybe because I wasn't using the same stone, or I wasn't on the machine. I don't know. So this next story is, oh, I'll put it in the chat for you all. It is a Harvard physicist says that the meteor fragments might be pieces of a technological gadget from outer space. So this is relatively short. It's uh, fox59.com. Uh, nearly a decade ago, a meteor traveling faster than 95% of nearby stars crashed into the Pacific Ocean. I wonder how they know that. 95%. Harvard University astrophysicist Avi Loeb says there's a possibility it wasn't a space rock at all. Loeb just returned from an excursion to the Pacific, o Pacific Ocean, Pacific Ocean, the aim of which was to recover pieces of that meteor. He says those fragments could be the remains of a technological gadget from another solar system. The 50 tiny spherules or molten droplets, are believed to be made up of steel of a steel titanium alloy that is stronger than the iron found in other meteors. That, along with the meteor's speed, which he and other researchers sure of one thing, it's not from the solar system. Kind of a poorly written sentence there, but moving on. It's the first time that humans are holding in their hands material from a big object that came from interstellar space, Loeb said Wednesday on Cuomo while showing a visual containing one of the sphericals, spherules. And uh, the picture for those of you that are listening, which is uh, all of you, <laughs> uh, I don't have video up yet right now anyway, but uh, it's kind of uh, kind of got like a little rainbow sheen going on. And the uh, majority of it's the link you can share in chat, Bill, so I can take a look at that as well. Is it? Yeah, I thought I, yeah, I put it in there. He did. Oh, oh no, no, not in uh, got two different chats going oh, on. And I also okay. shared in there Avi Loeb's blog that he posts all of his updates on, so you can go directly there and view his research. Have you heard of this guy before? Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I, I go and read his blog almost daily. No way. This, this is the first time I've come. Yeah. yeah. How, how's this? I'll do your article better. Okay. Um, <laughs> essentially, um, there's asteroids and meteorites. So we know where they come from. You know, they're floating around in the Oort cloud or whatever. And then there's interstellar objects that are coming through from outside the solar system. There's very few of these. We haven't detected a lot. This one was confirmed to have come uh, from interstellar space. They did a calculation, um, was confirmed by the U.S. military. Um, or I guess you would say it would be like NORAD or whatever. Uh, but they basically said, yeah, you know, we have confirmed that this object came from outside of our solar system. So he uh, went ahead and did an expedition. He designed this sled that had all of these incredibly strong uh, rare earth magnets all over it in the hopes that there would be some magnetic material. And that is exactly what they discovered. So they did some test runs in the area around, then they did some test runs through the debris field where they thought that they were going to find this and they found uh it was like 50 or 80 of these um sphericals of metal and you could tell that they had been superheated they would be exactly what you were expected to see um and had encapsulated other metals or waters inside of them as they were heating and coming through uh but what is interesting that he said is this is the strongest uh, object that we've seen uh, re-enter space. So like uh, asteroid, meteorite, 
This is stronger than any of those, and those have been iron. So we're already dealing with something from outside the solar system. It's stronger than anything that we've seen. And he goes on to say, well, think about what's going to happen to the Voyager star, the Voyager um, you know, spacecraft that we put out there. Eventually, one day, they're going to leave our solar system, go and in, you know, in, interact with another solar system or galaxy somewhere else out there. So how hard is it to believe that this is exactly what happened? Or even simply, maybe it's a probe. You know, what do we do with our probes when we send them out when they're on their final destination? You know, uh, you crash them into the surface. They're no longer needed. There could be a reason for wanting to, you know, uh, destroy the evidence, if you will. Um, so, yeah, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I love it. And right now they're in the process of, you know, checking to see the isotope ratios and everything else. Make sure that uh, they can prove that it's got a, an unearthly origin. And who knows, you know, this might be a machine from another planet or another solar system. It could be. Derek, do you? Yeah, it's getting... crazy. The one I'm looking at now, and I'm on the blog, and they're showing the image, and it's half red and half blue, like split right down the middle. Is that the red pill and blue pill? That's interesting. Yeah, the uh, last little bit of the article here it just says that the discovery comes on the heels of a whistleblower's claim that the U.S. government is shielding information about a UFO retrieval program. Congress is investigating the matter, and Senator Marco Rubio said the whistleblower, former intelligence officer David Grush, is not the only person to have made such claims. Now that he's found the tiny fragments, Loeb is hoping to uh, he's hoping that he might retrieve a craft himself if there's any large debris from the meteor impact and a quote he says uh, if there is a any big relic we know where it should be located we are thinking about the next expedition and where or where we will scan the ocean floor with sonar and potentially find the core of this object and then it will be easy to tell whether it is a rock or a technological gadget I'm on to this bill. Have you been paying attention at all to the uh, National Defense Authorization UAP uh, legislation updates that have been getting pushed through? Yes, I actually just listened to a podcast on Ben's recommendation that had Dr. Stephen Greer on talking about how awesome when this this is legislation that gets passed and it'll have the six months for whistleblowers. Oh, yeah, but not even right? that. They're even doing it stronger. They're basically saying that if any private entity has in its possession any unearthly craft, uh, any, uh, you know, uh, non-human intelligence that it it is going to get turned over to the U.S. government for review. This is a superseding. And if you listen to. Um, oh, my God, I had a migraine the other day. I can't think of his name. Um, the guy who broke the story with David Grush, um, Cohart, um, I think is his name, who does the. Uh, the 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 podcast and everything with Bryce Abel doesn't matter. Anyways, um, he's saying that there have been private craft that have been recovered by private industry, that there is a way to find these things. And they have gone out. They have found them. They have recovered them. And it becomes this very, very weird place of a private industry that has its own um retrieval systems, its own technology, its own things that it's found. And now the government is coming in in a move that it's never really had the jurisdiction in any other place to do it and saying, anything you found is ours. And if you don't hand it over, there's there's going to be possible legal ramifications behind this. So it's an absolutely fascinating thing that's going on right now uh, within uh, the UAP uh, UFO realm. It is. And I forget what episode I was or what the podcast I was listening to that Ben recommended, but I I remember commenting after I had got done with the you know listening that it was frustrating and uh, exciting at the same time, right? Because this is you know a what uh, Stephen Doctor Doctor Greer is pushing for is for this release of technology to the masses, right? And we're talking about free energy, right? So nobody's connected to any grid anymore, and that these uh, this type of of uh technology will have to be slow slow rolled out right he's he he gives a time frame of two decades i think two or three decades if it's done 
with whatever plan that he's come up with but i don't know it makes it makes sense it makes sense to me do you guys have any any uh opinion i don't i don't know if we've talked about we have talked about stephen greer on the show before and i guess he came out with a new good document. luck getting it out of the keeper's hands you know this is such valuable such uh it's it's such incredible technology that it's going to be what is it like ben rich said it would take an act of god um you know to get this out from the the gatekeeper's hands so i think what we're getting is um a disclosure to the general population you know where the general populace becomes okay with it because it's being reported because uh, the stories are too numerous and too true and probably, um, you know, we're having an uptick in sightings, you know, all across the globe. It could be becoming a secret that they are unable to keep. And I mean, if you start going down some of the conspiracy realm, some of the crazy things that uh, uh, according to um, uh, Cohart, Cohart, I got to find his name, um, who um, who did the the David Grush story. Um, he's saying that a lot of the people are telling him that this has to do with catastrophism, that the reason that these things are showing up here at this time is that there's been some dates that have been named in the late 20, like 27, uh, 2030s, that there is going to be a cataclysmic event on Earth and that the time has run up, that there were agreements that were put in place with the government and the government is behind that essentially, you know, um, this coming out may not be the, this isn't what he's saying, but now I'm, I'm interjecting here. You know, this might be the phenomenon itself um, making itself known. I mean, if you start going down the realms that seem to be hinted at from, uh, from David Grush, uh, from a lot of the, the whistleblowers, uh, there's an aspect of time here that it's not just where did they come from? Where is the dimension that you have ships that are capable of uh, warping space and time? You go into the ships and they're 30 times the size that they would seem. You're in there for 30 minutes. You come out. It's five hours later that you're dealing with possibly life that is more terrestrial than we are. And it's got me really thinking along this amazing way that if you think of like cataclysmic cycles and cataclysm on earth and then you look at mass water flows on mars and you realize that mars used to be a planet uh, maybe exactly like ours in you know biodiversity that it might start to become that if time travel could be possible and on a long enough time scale of multiple risings and fallings of humanity of different beings that it could be that surviving is across time and that we as humans have always been kind of living in this this weird world that is being manipulated on a time level where the past is trying to interact with the future because there is only uh, segments of time that can be lived in, that can be survived in. And so... I don't know. It's 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 become really fascinating to me that that is actually becoming more of a mainstream way of thinking that, I don't know, um, time travelers, us, you know, uh, different inhabitants, who knows? But it certainly opens it up to a, a much crazier conspiracy than, you know, uh, it's aliens from Zeta Reticuli. You know, it could be aliens from two million years ago. Or it could be us. But that's what I mean, like, what I mean, like from two million years ago, yeah, it could be a species that was on this planet. It could be us. It could be a breakaway civilization that went and got went off into the future and has come back. I mean, it's I don't know. It's it's a really, really, really cool way of thinking for me, because I mean, if you just look at how crazy the world is and, you know, uh, Mandela events and all these other weird things that get ingrained in our culture, you know. Uh, deja vus uh, it would make a lot more sense if time was constantly being manipulated around us um, maybe that is what the world would look like and we're just seeing it we just you know up until modern times maybe haven't been quite capable of believing it's a possibility 
I love how this topic keeps popping up. Time on your Chrononaut Chronicles. It's, it's, it's a you're surprised, it's, Bill? No, it's me. That? <laughs> I mean, you're casting the spell every time you open, you know, you open the the room up. It's, so, yeah. and yeah, I mean, Adam nailed it as far as um, how I think about it and my understanding of it from, you know, channeling from outside this dimension and yeah it's all happening all of the time all at once right so um finding those frequencies and how to tune into them or finding those portals and how to interact with those other timelines or you know pick your pick your language on what you want to call it um being able to to shift your perception into having that, that be in your reality um aliens bigfoot angels demons that's how it all kind of comes through in in that energetic field so one of the really interesting things that Dr. Greer brought up in one of his his positions, and this this rolls into our next story here. So I'll put this in the chat, both chats. This is a prepare for change dot net, and it is uh, forced and faked alien abductions were conducted by the CIA, according to a renowned researcher. So this is this is relatively long uh, blog post. I'm not going to read the whole thing but in brief the facts in his book forbidden science Four, dr jacques valet explains how he came in possession of documents showing that forced ufo abductions were conducted by the cia as psychological warfare experiments reflect on what type of technology would the cia have to have in order to pull something like this off and then it goes into a quite a lengthy uh story here but uh, my point being, uh, to tie it back to Dr. Greer, was that uh, the, these, all the documented uh, negative experiences that people, contactees have had, are made, are done by us, like by humans, or by on other humans. And it's made to look alien as part of like this Project Bluebeam type, type of operation. And uh, the other... So the flip side to that would be that all all uh, true extraterrestrial biological entities would be uh, benevolent, which uh, throws up a huge red flag for me because I don't necessarily like speaking in absolutes like that. I was wondering if anybody had any other insights on uh, or opinions on whether all all uh, higher or or, or all ets are benevolent or yeah that that's really my biggest uh complaint i ever have with um with greer is is that viewpoint because i i mean i view the world how people are how the ocean is you know there's wolves in the world there's sharks in the ocean you know uh there's good people there's bad people you know why you know why would 100 percent of all species that have advanced beyond us be moral and good you know um you know there's even um there's very interesting research in like what happens to people when they're isolated and alone like when you're in outer space when they do psychological tests you know you start thinking differently you start um valuing things differently so you know what happens to you when you're a spacer out there you know for 20 or 30 or 40 years you know when you're a civilization Um, you know, that's just grown up in different cultures. I mean, on this planet, like we have dolphins that we grew up with, you know, that we've evolved on the same planet with, and we can't, I mean, we can communicate with them, but we can't have a regular conversation. We don't fully understand each other. And now, you know, what's the moral difference between us here? And then let's take that to an nth degree outside. So yeah, I, to me, it seems like, you know, as above, so below, I have to see good and bad aliens. 
I agree 100% with Adam. Uh, yeah, that's without question. There's all flavors. I haven't heard anybody say they're all benevolent, but I mean, the experiences I've had um, have been you know the the shamanic experiences that get dark and shadowy um some people would call that a bad trip right but i was actually prepared for it and and, and intended for that um you know metaphysical death so to speak so it wasn't bad right so it is just how you are you're going to perceive it um and as a collective, whatever we're, you know, paying our attention to is how uh, the matrix and reality is created. So think however we approach it is how it will respond as well. Yeah, so I guess there could be I'm trying to do some some mental gymnastics to make a case for uh, all all ETs are benevolent, and so bouncing ideas off the wall here, guys. If if we take morality as something that is relative, depending on whatever belief system or culture we're operating in, you know, something that is good for uh, headhunters and cannibals is probably not going to be good for somebody that doesn't doesn't drive with those practices, right? So extrapolating this out into ET land, right? We have uh, different morality structures. And uh, so maybe those ETs are acting in accordance with whatever belief system they're, they're operating, whatever operating system they have, right? So maybe, maybe it could be said that they're operating for you know, the, the greater good according to their agenda, right? Because everybody's got an agenda. Even, you know, everybody, right? Even plants, minerals. Well, exactly. And it might be agendas that are not even capable of us understanding, you know, if or, you or perceiving, even. Exactly. Just look at the difference between us and an ant. Try communicating with an ant, trying to find and understand the emotion and the intent, you know, of the ant high, you know, versus, you know, your intent. And, you know, you're never going to make a communicative. Uh, communication between the two, even though logically, hey, it would really benefit you guys if I could figure out a way where you won't invade my house and I have to mass murder you all the time and I can provide for you. But we cannot even do that. We're only first into this, you know, um, you know, me or them. And so, yeah, you know, if the divide is that great between us and another species, I just you know, good luck figuring out morality at all. I, I don't even know if it's even capable. Like, what's the moral of a wolf versus the moral of a human? Well, and and it, it is sort of the same, under the same lines as going back into nature, right? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff out there that'll, you know, eat you just as quick as anything else. So, and you, you just can't really worry about it, right? Well, so, in, in, in the my... same in the same vein, if the ships show up and a bunch of stuff jumps out of the ship, that thinks human brains, you know, taste like ice cream. Well, then we got to deal with that then. But up until then, like, I don't know, why worry about it? Well, so to go on to <laughs> the edges of fringe here, you know, 90,000 Americans disappear every year and are never found. You know, there's a lot of missing people. The abduction story has been a long told tale. You know, uh, look at missing 411, you know, and all the stuff that goes along with that. So uh, who knows? You know, maybe, you know, I've heard uh, I've heard I think it, it was Ross Colhart, by the way, the uh, the investigative journalist. And I heard him say this as well. Um, you know, what if it's a truth that's just it's too terrible to tell that this is something that um, it's kept a secret because it's it's too awful. And maybe that secret is something very simply as that, that this is an ecosystem. This is a farm, just like we would go into the woods and hunt a deer, an elk or a turkey that maybe biology is harvested on this planet by other species in a same or similar way. And, well, you know, how are we going to look down upon another animal if something's more advanced? So, you know, and maybe that's just a small part of, you know, uh, 
the mystery. But yeah, man, it terrifies me that that could be a reality that, you know, that'd be, that'd be pretty karmic, wouldn't it for us? But to yeah. go back to what Bill was talking well, about, would put us where we need to show, be. well, to go back to what Bill was saying at the beginning of the show and finding the silver lining, that's a perspective you can take. But you can also take the perspective that we really have no idea. So what if it turns out even better than we can imagine? You know, and that is <laughs> finding that silver lining, um, finding your light, not letting the shadow run the run the show, you know. Yeah. yeah and that's the other speaking of. The big, going back to the beginning of the segment, something I forgot to mention, in in con in conjunction with the the silver lining is, um, is that this too shall pass, right? This this that idea of whatever is happening, right? It shall pass. Yeah, and I might sound negative, but I I view it more in the uh, light is the best disinfection. So if that's the truth, heck, I want to know. But you know, would certainly give a reason why, you know, what would be the reason that we would never be told that at least aliens exist? Well, you know, maybe because it's too terrible for them to say, hey, uh, this is going on and there's nothing we can do about it. Have fun well, when did we start trusting the government with anything? Like, why do we give a shit about disclosure from them? We know they lie to us forever about pretty much everything. So, like, the fact that there are people out there who have had experiences and are telling their experiences, myself included, like, let's, let's listen to them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, and I think the really, why do we give a shit about up. what Washington thinks? Yeah. When we all, all, you know, when the rest of it from the last crisis to the one before to the one before, you know, people finding, you know, poking the holes and finding how they're using it as an opportunity. So, you know, it's just, you gotta, in my eyes, like, that's the the fear tactic and the divide and conquer tactic at play. So just having that more, uh, you know, it's not just like toxic positivity and everything's going to be okay, but going forward with, you know, picking which paths to take having that lighter vibration is what helps reality reflect that back on everybody. Yeah. It's wonderful. So we can, we can pick and choose which path to take every time. And the deeper you dig into the physics of it, you know, you might go have a completely different reality depending on which version and which perspective you start to view life through yeah yeah going taking it back to perspective is one of my favorite topics and that i think is going to do it for the silver segment i did want to reiterate that uh you know as part of the goal behind this is is to remember and we didn't get into anything too not too negative as far as story wise this episode, but oftentimes we will find that the media is full of negative stories, right? And we are inundated with it. Whether we, you know, want it or not, it seems like, right? So uh, just remember that uh, this too shall pass. And a fun little snippet on that that phrase was actually, I've heard, uh, it was, a, was engraved on King Solomon's ring which allowed him to to uh control demons and have them do his bidding so and uh, there's a little uh, little um tie-in to to the pentacle there as well and sir Gawain. so if you uh, heard a few episodes ago that should ring a bell for you but this uh, this will conclude the silver segment for this episode there was only two stories we didn't get to but i'll save them for next time because i still think that they're pretty interesting and we did cover the abduction one which i mentioned in the intro uh, so the third segment which is still called the third segment i guess we could call it the gold segment but 
there's number three with gold. I don't, I don't know. I'll do some more thinking about that. Open to suggestions, by the way. Definitely want to give it a, more of a creative name than the third segment. But this segment is supposed to be all about empowerment, right? So the the goal, the idea, the point behind the third segment is to remind us that uh, we are capable of truly miraculous things uh, when we put our minds to it, right? So a lot of uh, drawing from uh, Neville Goddard type of, of thinking, and we've read from, oh, who else have we had? I'm reading a lot of Charles Hannell, which we haven't, I haven't shared on the show yet because his, his works are a little bit more uh, wordy, a lot more vocabulary, but uh, along the same lines as Napoleon Hill, uh, maybe Dale Carnegie, um, but he's, I'm reading the new psychology right now. I will share stuff from him uh, down the road, but yeah, uh, the point is just to uh, to give everybody a little piece of empowerment and to remind themselves that uh, you, you're the shit, really, and you're awesome, and uh, you can do pretty much anything uh, you put your mind to. And so this, these are just little reminders of uh, perspective, right? And let's get the, uh, the perspective that is the best and the highest for us that enables us to do the, the best things uh, for our highest good, right? So, uh, oh yeah, we we covered uh, Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, which uh, I am going to adopt as my my framework, one of my lenses to to view the world on view, through, and uh, so that means the show will be adopting it as well. So um, maybe we'll do a little uh, review every now and again or something. I'll bring it up at least once a show. But uh, recently, Ben and I, Ben and I, have been going through the Celestine prophecy uh, insights we've gone through the first nine there's 12 all together so we'll do the last three uh we'll do the last three today and i was planning on uh, summarizing the first nine at least reading the the uh the first little snippet on the website just to catch everybody up for anybody that hasn't been following along and so while I'm doing that, please feel free to interrupt with any uh, thoughts or ideas that pop into your guys' heads. And then uh, I'll read the, the whole entry for the last three here. So, excuse me, just one moment. So the first, in the first insight is a critical mass. It says that a new spiritual awakening is occurring in human culture an awakening brought about by a critical mass of individuals who experience their lives as a spiritual unfolding, a journey in which we are led forward by mysterious coincidences. All right, so the idea behind the first insight is that we've reached this critical mass junction. The second insight is the longer now. This awakening represents the creation of a new, more complete worldview which replaces a 500-year-old preoccupation with secular survival and comfort. While this technological preoccupation was an important step, our awakening to life's coincidences is opening us up to the real purpose of human life on this planet and the real nature of our universe. So if I remember correctly in the book, this is where he kind of sur sur summarizes the scientific world and in, in, in his progression in into materialism over the last 500 years and the exploitation of the earth for its resources and now that we're coming to understand that it's you know maybe we could treat uh our planet a little better right so the third third insight is a matter of energy it says that we now experience that we live not in a material universe but in a universe of dynamic energy everything Extant is a field of sacred energy that we can sense and intuit. Moreover, we humans can project our energy by focusing our attention in the desired direction. Where attention goes, energy flows, influencing other energy systems and increasing the pace of coincidences in our lives. And we know that coincidences aren't really coincidences. They have meaning. 
two, oh, so the fourth insight, uh, the struggle for power. Too often, humans cut themselves off from the greater source of this energy and then feel weak and insecure. To gain energy, we tend to manip manipulate or force others to give us attention and their energy. When we successfully dominate others in this way, we feel more powerful, but they are left weakened and often fight back. Competition for scarce human energy is the cause of all conflict between people, which is kind of interesting. So we're talking about human energy here, not necessarily like fossil fuels and and uh, you know other types of energy. It's the energy that we get from being around and with and in contact and communion with other other entities. The fifth insight is the message of the mystics. Insecurity and violence ends when we experience an inner connection with divine energy within, a connection described by mystics of all traditions, a sense of lightness and buoyancy, along with the constant sensation of love, are measures of this connection. If these measures are present, a connection is real. If it is not, it is only pretended. So I think in the book he said that the the measure of this is is self love, right? Like how much self love you have will be the uh, guide stick, the the marker, right, for for how uh, how much you're connected with divine energy, which I think I would I would agree with. The sixth insight. Clearing the past. The more we stay connected, the more we are acutely aware of those times when we lose connection, usually when we are under stress. In these times, we can see our own particular way of stealing energy from others. Once our manipulations are brought to personal awareness, our connection becomes more constant and we can discover our own growth path in life and our spiritual mission, the, person, the personal way we can contribute to the world. I like how uh, this one talks about uh, personal awareness. Awareness is one of the three masteries that is brought up in the Four Agreements by Don Miguel. Uh, mastery of awareness, mastery of transformation, which is what the agreements are used for, and then the mastery of intent being the third one, which is which is love. The so to yeah so seventh insight engaging flow. Knowing our personal mission further enhances the flow of mysterious coincidences as we are guided toward our destinies. First, we have a question, then dreams, daydreams, and intuitions lead us towards the answers, which are usually synchronistically provided by the wisdom of another human being. So this is the idea that like everybody, that we, we can learn something from everybody that we come across, right? I love that uh, uh, Waldo, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, I believe, something along the lines of being every man being your teacher, right? There's somebody has, a, everybody has a message, some kind of message for, for us to, to deliver in our lives. And we have to engage them in uh, the correct way to, to figure out what it is. And it's often happens synchronistically, right? The eighth insight, the interpersonal ethic, we can increase the frequency of guiding coincidences by uplifting every person that comes into our lives. And this is the how we engage other people correctly, right? Uh, care must be taken not to lose our interconnection in romantic relationships. Lifting, uplifting others is especially effective in groups where each member can feel energy of all the others. With children, it is extremely important for their early security and growth. By seeing the beauty in every face, we lift others into their wisest self and increase the chances of hearing a synchronistic message. So I actually had a question on this one for Derek. He was not here the last time we went through it, but the mention of the wisest self, when we lift others into their wisest self, I know that in our remote sessions together, Derek, we'll often do healings for for this or that or work on this, you know, you know, pick a problem, right? <laughs> and uh, 
we uh, when we're trying to visualize that there is no like there is no injury. I don't have an issue. I'm a perfect example of perfect love here and now. That is that's what I mean. You're you're lifting. You're uplifting me or whoever you're talking to to their wisest self. Is it, is this kind of like a is that an ample description of how you would um, describe kind of um, how you work? Other, other than the part of you know rising up, and I know you're not meaning it that way or lifting up, because then that kind of gives you the the thought of having to go somewhere else, or it's it's really I would say I, I like the visual of you know having it already inside of your heart or heart chakra, and then tuning into it from there that way all of your then when you run this stuff through your head and whatever spiel as i put it um because you know we word it different ways from different you know locations on the planet we call it these things from different terms and this is so hard to talk about um but i would i would imagine so use your of course imagination emotions to imagine it already emanating from within you and never rise into or, or outside of or something like that um and then it gets it. Ha and again, I don't have a manual on any of this. It's just, again, trying each of us in our own words, trying to reiterate this. But as I do that, like, again, my ears are ringing crazy right now, almost painful. It's so much um, to when I'm tuning in to do this. So I kind of just stumbled through it myself. And when I realized things like, well, not and I use the description or analogy of like if I have a bunch of farm fields where I'm mystical wear. So if I went and worked in one of those or your garden home or whatever, got all dirty and jumped in bed and pulled the blankets over yourself. So think covering up over that didn't accomplish much but if you want to remove stuff you know you can imagine it you know whatever you want coming from the inside out and then always just releasing the outer excess layer um and i still i don't know if that makes too much sense but it's more about just getting each of us to think about we already are and then it happens we have nothing to accomplish we just need to get the hell out of our own way and realize we already are um sometimes that's term the i am or you know we're all connected, you know, different ways, but I hope that made some sense. Um, when yeah. I was trying to get across is that because it ties into the idea of expansion that you've helped me come to terms with in inner, that, yeah, yeah, exactly, that, right? As opposed to growth, like uplifting, like going up, growing up, right? It's it's we're it, we're filling in a space that already exists with the awareness that it does exist, right? Yeah, it's like, well, a lot of us think, well. We can only smell with our noses. Well, no, and or taste with our mouths. Well, no, actually, it's the inverse. I mean, you only taste five different flavors. Smelling, it's count. I don't even know how many there are on that one. So we just have to realize that, have the aha moment of realization, and then you can start working from that again. And that doesn't mean that somebody had to practice smelling things or tasting. Just have that expansion of understanding, and then the ability, air quotes here, nobody sees, turns on. And this leads to uh, expanded awareness, the mastery of awareness, right? We get these extra sensory inputs, right? But, right, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, I've turned before, but and others I'm sure I have as well, but your your chakras or metaphysical senses, you know, blend them with your physical ones because, and then they all happen. It's just a knowing. It's not something you have to do. Uh, a certain recipe or process. There's lots of things that will assist in that, like the breathing exercises and things talked about earlier on. Fantastic. Um, and there's many ways of doing that, but it really is just having the realization. And at least that's how I did it was I realized I went through, I'm OCD minded, meaning just, I have to analyze everything and nitpick. So I don't know how many decades ago when I went through the whole psychic thing or remote viewing thing, I tried to call BS on it all, but with an open mind. And I'm so confident of a person that I'm like, well, I'm going to ride this wave wherever it goes. And then by the end of the, the wave, you know, I was surfing and I was like, oh, shit, this is a thing. Yeah, they describe it confusing. I read Journey Out of the Body back in the 80s. Um, by, you know, there's lots of books and things, but you see, those are cookbooks as suggestions and then follow your own gut instincts. Um, I think Ben has mentioned that before. And then that's just getting in the kitchen and cooking and this stuff turns up from there so again we all already have it all well and derek if i can jump in here too because um i've been trying to expand my awareness on the chakras as senses since the first time i heard you say that and uh after that session you and i had 
um, I've been sitting in with that a lot more and trying to feel into it more. And one thing that's come through is it's not just the I am um, statement and feeling. That's all root chakra, right? And as you go up through the other chakras with whatever, um, you know, energetic that you're dealing with, it become it it moves through them as senses as well and you know getting up to that crown and it becomes one of those knowings at that point and that's the realization so as you can you can take <laughs> whatever the energetic issue is through each of those steps and you know um take on attributes of that chakra right so as it moves through the solar plexus you're getting more courageous to and shining more light onto it, golden light, you know, and really take it into your heart space, let it expand there. And as you work them through, it it seems to settle in and integrate into more of more of the being instead of the knowing, right? Yeah, that's a good description. Absolutely. As you as you do that, it's like, you know, ex- eating food, you, you know, you can go through in, where you're talking chakras or in this analogy, the physical senses, you see it first, you feel it, then you taste it, you know, and then it all enhances as you go from there. Um, I just say go at everything open minded and just experience and then experience on all levels. You Because you can experience even in my I keep jumping to food analogies, probably I'm hungry, um, where you can experience that metaphysically. And we all do. It's called. Um, in some circles, muscle testing or energy testing, you can pick something up and all of a sudden, if your intuition goes off and you get a nausea and you just have to, you can think a nausea that can occur to you that way. You don't necessarily have to get physically nauseous, but that's your body telling you it's out of alignment with you. But we often, you know, go so quickly through, I think just physical senses, we don't perceive our food our drink our room we just walked into, um, but there's input on all the levels. Yeah, that's awesome, Ben. That, that thank you for making that connection and taking whatever your the issue that you're working on, moving it up the, the, through the different levels and uh, using the different methods of of the physical senses to and our mental faculties. Right when we get up to the crown, to to bask in I'm saying bask, but to to uh, manifest really whatever our aim is. Because that reminds me of a lot of what Neville Goddard always talks about. He always talks about, you know, getting into that hypnagogic state, but then, you know, still maintaining a level of consciousness or awareness to where you can, you know, mentally be in, you know, that state of that you desire. So I was going to say basking is a great word for it because you can get to that, you know, a lot like neville would say is is the you know you got to feel it and and if you are basking in that feeling you know much like basking in the sun or or in the shower or whatever right you're really absorbing it and and embodying it taking it in yeah i like that good takeaway for the episode but moving on the ninth insight is the emerging culture says as we all evolve toward the best contemplation of our emotion of our spiritual missions the technological means of survival will be fully automated as humans focus instead on synchronistic growth such growth will move humans into higher energy states ultimately transforming our bodies into spiritual form and uniting the dimension of existence with the afterlife dimension thus ending the cycle of birth and death so that was where we stopped on the last episode so these last three will be new for for everybody and i will read everything on the blog post which i did not share in the chat until right now so there you go uh, the 10th insight is holding the vision the 10th insight is the realization that throughout history human beings have been unconsciously struggling to implement this lived spirituality on earth Each of us comes here on assignment, and as we pull this understanding into consciousness, we can remember a full birth vision of what we wanted to accomplish with our lives. 
Furthermore, we can remember a common world vision of how we will all work together to create a new spiritual culture. We know that our challenge is to hold this vision with intention and prayer every day. Life in heaven guiding us on earth. At this level of expanded consciousness, we become clearly aware of the life and death cycle of humanity. The afterlife becomes not an abstract idea, but a real place with real activities. As this rapid spiritualization continues, the veil between earth and heaven begins to part, and we rise to sense and feel those in the afterlife with a new reality. According to polls, the most frequently mentioned spiritual experience is that of having contact with a recently departed loved one. Usually they want to convey that they're fine, but just as often they are trying to help us in some way. They are active in our lives on earth. Our insight is that departed friends and loved ones are close to us, sending us messages, reminders, and uplifting us into our missions. Before we are born, we have a vision of this mission. When we get here, it goes unconscious as we are being educated. Then, as we move through the stages of life, it comes back into awareness. First, as attractions and amazing synchronicities that are trying to wake us up, followed by a full-blown inspiring goal. With this insight, we are making the higher meaning of life more conscious and self-evident, while leading more people to catch the vision, and thus accelerate both their lives and the progress of the world. So I like this one because it mentions that uh, our vision of our life mission goes unconscious as we're being educated. And this ties right back into uh, Don Miguel's work in this process of education he calls domestication, right? Where we uh, kind of are overtaken by the metote of, of the dream of the world, right? All these thousands of different voices and opinions trying to influence us, right? It's overwhelming and uh, we lose sight of why we're here. And then we kind of eventually, you know, come out of, come out of the, the stupor after we find ourselves in after getting domesticated, right? And this is what Don Miguel calls the, the awareness of the second dream, right? Which is the dream that we write for ourselves, right? What, what do we want to manifest? And we can differentiate between our dream and, and the metote. This is part of increasing our awareness, right? Our mastery of awareness. The 11th insight, extending prayer fields. The 11th insight is the precise method through which we hold the vision. For centuries, religious scriptures, poems, and philosophies have pointed to a latent power of mind within all of us that mysteriously helps to affect what occurs in the future. It has been called faith power, positive thinking, and the power of prayer. We are now taking this power seriously enough to bring a fuller knowledge of it into public awareness. We are finding that this prayer power, we are finding that this prayer power is a field of intention which moves out from us and can be extended and strengthened, especially when we connect with others in a common vision. This is the power through which we hold the vision of a spiritual world and build the energy in ourselves and in others to make this vision a reality. The power of prayer. In, in this level of consciousness, we become more purpose-driven and receptive to how those in the afterlife are lifting us up. We begin to comprehend the real nature of prayer and guided purpose. We realize that prayer works within karmic design. The more we are in alignment with the principle of giving and our inner intuition to actually helping others, we will sense our heightened creative power and see it working through our prayers. When we use this power for uplifting the spiritual consciousness of others, we draw more powerful people into our lives to uplift us. The key is discovering that affirmative prayer practiced with the emotion of gratitude, it will happen, establishes the strongest faith validity. That's the 11th insight. So this also reminds me a whole lot 
of Neville Goddard. Uh, not only him, but uh, Batum Zeeland, who wrote Reality Transfer. But yeah, the, the holding of the purpose and uh, you know the positive thinking, all these, all these labels and terms kind of fall all, all fall under the, the category of um, I don't want to say self help, but I guess that would be the the common term. Like like I said before, writings like uh, Charles Handel or or uh, Napoleon Dynam Napoleon Dynamite Napoleon Hill or uh, Dale Carnegie, like the, these these are made in Zealand, right? They talk about having a vision, and then the Bible talks about. It. I mean, Neville does a great job breaking that down, but yeah, it's uh, being consistent in in your purpose and uh not being discouraged despite the signs that you you might find around yourself and uh so and because of that if you do that right and with this emotion of gratitude that it will happen you're, you're going to see results basically is what i think this insight is saying which brings us to the last one the 12th insight the hour of decision. Armed with divine confidence, we begin to take the next step to self-knowledge. We experience times when a greater sense of divine beings. Oh, when a sense. We experience times when a greater sense of divine begins to dwell within us. This indwelling feels like a rush. Feels like I guess it does feel like a rush because I just said it. This indwelling feels like a sense of God presence. We still have a personal identity, but this status becomes subservient to a complete consciousness of love, patience, and openness to action. For this presence to remain or get more powerful, we must be totally transcendent of our control dramas or movements where we do not act on our own intuition of other people's best interest. In this sense, divine presence is always there unless our bad habits put distance between us. Simply put, the process is this. When we're not in the flow, we feel disconnected and either anxious or frustrated. So we distract ourselves with various compulsive activities designed to make our misery go away. It could be anything from over shopping, compulsory watching sports or celebrities, the actual addictive behavior from sex to drugs. Everyone knows what his or her vices are, including you, the transcending them Oh, and transcending them keeps you in touch with the magic of synchronicity. The sensation of God's presence inside of us. Feeling God's familiar presence, you will sense the flow of your, of your destiny unfolding at any age and move into sincere awareness of the distractions and addictions your ego has always devised to sidetrack yourself. The presence then becomes non-dual, existing both within and outside of us at the same time. When we are acting in karmic alignment, it brings us an even greater intuitive knowledge that animates the truth we tell to others. This enlarges us beyond our wildest dreams, providing we always act in harmony and recognition of it. We must never walk into a room without consciously realizing how his presence moves into the room with us. He keeps us in a relative zone of near-miraculous helping. Furthermore, by getting into alignment with this design, you set the stage for a complete integration of all the insights and for sustained higher consciousness at the levels, as the levels work together automatically. And that's the end of the 12th insight. And that's the last one. So, that uh, this will be the last time we talk about the insights in the third segment. Uh, what did uh, this is there anything that was said in the synopsis that anybody disagrees with, or does this seem like a relatively uh, sound prophecy? I guess we'll call it because the book's called Celestine Prophecy. I mean, it seems kind of uh, on point 
to me, especially because it mentioned the whole automated the automation of, of, you know, commerce, right. And people having more time to pursue their, you know, what truly inspires them. So I'd say that it's, it's pretty spot on. Well, I'll say, I hope a lot of it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I don't think that the, the last few insights are covered in the, the first book, the Celestine Prophecy, I think they stop at like eight or nine. So these last three are new, newer, I believe for me anyway, they are because I didn't, I don't remember reading about them. But uh, yeah, just some some food for thought. And uh, it did mention the control dramas, the twelfth insight, the last one I just read, and uh, that is also brought up. I believe in the fourth insight, yes, and the it is the fourth. But the control dramas are a kind of a a scale of behavior in which we can use to identify how uh, one might get energy from another person, and this uh, ranges from uh, you know being very aggressive, intimidating, to playing the aloof card, right? So we have all this this big spectrum in between. And this is really the point or the thing that spoke to me the most after reading the book and why I wanted to talk about it on the show is just to draw attention to these different categories. And maybe we'll go into more depth on this in another episode. But uh, it is super helpful to understand how to uh, approach a particular person or a situation and how to deal with that energy and because, uh, you know, knowledge is half the battle. So once you know exactly what's going on and you identify it, you 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 know how to address it. So I think that those are four uh, very helpful control drama categories, whatever you want to call them, to, uh, to look into just for study of uh, interpersonal behavior among humans, really, Ben. Well, it's just it's it's very similar to, um, you know, working through archetypes or something like that, or uh, personality types, right? Um, and it is it it just goes along with how to to read the energy and read the energy of the person and to help you see where they're coming from, maybe too. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, the other. I believe one of the other uh, connections I was able to make with the four agreements is that the the, the person that w when you do identify, let's say, a uh, aggressive control drama in one in, in a particular, you know, anybody, right? It's not their fault that they have that particular control drama. Uh, we find this in Don Miguel's work too. That they were mm -hmm. conditioned to be this right we're all domesticated to be like this so there's no blame it's a trauma response right exactly yeah and that's another you know and that's that's what i found you know like comparing it to the archetypes or whatever it's the whole both books um are really just a softer language of like that alchemical process of you know burning the soul down to ashes and rising anew um and and it's i don't know <laughs> it it took me through a lot of that process uh the first time i read it when i was younger and now re going through it again i can i'm seeing it in a couple of different lights i guess good good Adam, did you have any, have you read this book before, or Derek? Do you have any other thoughts? Nope, you are my first introduction. Actually, mine too. And I was just thinking, hey, I may have to to pick it up and uh, go back over it. Yeah, yeah, that would be you know, if you guys want to uh, give it a go and then report back, give us a little another insight to add. Maybe I don't know. That'd be cool. You could certainly talk about this more. I did want to get into the control dramas a little bit more uh, deeply just because I think they're super useful. But aside from that, I did want to remind everybody to sign up for the 
free scalar energy session this week available through mysticalwares.com. This week is going to be the digestion and gut health, which is one of my favorite ones. Not only because I'm doing a, a cleanse at the moment, but uh, just because I was reading in, in Charles Handel's writings the other day, he's talking about the solar plexus and where we, this is where a lot of, uh, there's actually brain matter and cells and in, in, in the two crescent shapes in, in this area of our body, right? And this is also an energy center, a big energy center where we hold uh, a lot of our confidence, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> but uh, speaking of confidence, um, yeah, having a good, clean gut certainly affects how you think, how you feel. So uh, do yourself a little favor and sign up for the, the free Scalar Energy session. Uh, this is all based off of uh, Royal Raymond Rife's work, I believe. Is that is a machine that you have a Rife machine? Is that what it's called, a Rife machine, or is it different? Um, well, it's a scalar wave energy machine that, that um, broadcasts the frequencies of Rife frequency codes. So it's a spooky two machine that generates scalar energy waves, and then we basically interject the Rife codes into it. I know there's a whole lot there. Um, but we do have a web page for those listeners on miscores.com that on scalar energy that does describe it a lot better than I just tried to as well. Well, I will make sure to link that in the show notes. I'll link it directly to the page for ease of access for the listeners. And until next time, chrononauts, carpe diem. Okay, I stopped the broadcast.